thank you all for uh, for being here again uh, this morning and for our robust uh, discussions uh, yesterday. Uh, it was uh, both fun and enlightening, and it's great to be back together. And it's great that all of you found uh, uh, enough uh, uh, in enlightenment or fun uh, uh, last night that you would return this morning. So. I, I want to I do a few minutes uh, with a couple of thoughts about yesterday uh, as a segue into today, uh, and then I will uh, jump right into an introduction of Tim Coates and, and the Freckle Report uh, uh, momentarily. So I, I, I learned one important thing yesterday, and that is that we are all part of the Illuminati. <laughs> and I want you to know that I have already heard from Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, she, wa she wants to join. Um, the, the other thing that, that I heard, I think, loud and clear uh, yesterday is that librarians, particularly the librarians who are, the, who are gathered here, uh, but many others as well, um, are entrepreneurs and innovators. Uh, and, I, and I think that's an important takeaway for, for a number of different reasons. Um, it, it is that we have, no, the, the first and most important reason is that we have a lot of agency with what we do. We, there, we have power in the library world. And it, a, a, as, as libraries get bigger and more institutional, the, the, the largest urban libraries, if you're part of the city county system, uh, if you have uh, uh, in, in a small town or uh, suburban environment, you have a particularly active board. Uh, I, I think you all know what I'm talking about. Uh, it, it, of course, there are limitations to this, but, but we shouldn't ever lose the, the, the important notion that as librarians, as library directors, that we have agency in the world. And um, I think uh, uh, Felton and Carmen and Diane certainly demonstrated that, and, and I know so many of the people in this room uh, who have also demonstrated that. Um, it's easy, I think, to, uh, in, in the incredibly difficult times, the things that, that Bob and Shaylin talked about uh, yesterday, the, the things that I mentioned in, in my introduction, the polarization in our world, there, sometimes there is the, uh, the tendency, been tendencies certainly over the last couple of years for us to lose sight of that, that we have significant agency in the world. And we'll talk some more about, about that with Tim and with Tony um, uh, and with Marianne in terms of reading uh, and literacy and equity and, uh, and, and where those things meet. Um, I understand there was some conversation, particularly with our academic colleagues, uh, about the relationship of literacy and reading and what librarians do, the ecology uh, of that and its relationship to equity. And I do believe that that is the single most important uh, question uh, before us today, and that Tim will have a lot to say about that, Marianne will have a lot to say about that, and I can't wait to hear whatever Tony has to say about anything. Um, but I think that, I keep that in mind as we go through what we're going through today, the, the relationship of these things, because sometimes I think we, we lose, we lose uh, that relationship. Um, Another thing that is a takeaway, and Felton had said this to me before the conference, and he said it during the conference, and, and, and I, I, mentioned, I mentioned it in my remarks last night, but I want to repeat it. Um, I, I think there is a tendency for us to come away from a meeting like this, both inspired and determined to do something, and then we say, um, well, we could do that, or you know, Carmen and Diane can do that, um, but can everybody do that? Are we all superhuman? Uh, and the answer, of course, is no, and we're not. Uh, it, what is the average librarian, the average library director? What, what are they able to do? And, and, and that's why I brought up Jaime Escalante last night. I'm not sure I finished that thought, but I do want to finish that thought this morning. Uh, in, in the work that I've done over the, uh, the last 30 years of my life, I've chaired a commission on the future of higher education in the, in the state of Missouri that was sponsored by Pew as a sort of model for the National Governors Conference. I worked with the Kauffman Foundation. Monroe was there uh, for many years uh, very closely on, on these issues. I worked inside, the, not, not just with the Kansas City uh, School District, but I worked inside the Kansas City School District. Uh, the, the, the library worked with individual schools, charter schools in the district. Um, 
when I was in St. Louis, uh, I, I was involved uh, with uh, Bill Danforth, the Chancellor of Washington University, and others in the in the ending of the desegregation suits in Kansas City and St. Louis, which was a huge thing, huge thing nationally, billions and billions of dollars, et cetera. I feel I have a right to say a couple of things to you about this that I think are important things to be said. The first thing I want to say is, on the side of the kids that we deal with, the kids are capable. That's, that's the takeaway I have from what Jaime Escalante did with the calculus class in, uh, in the Barrio School in LA is the kids actually have the capability. Um, and, and, and in the desegregation suit, it was interesting to me, um, th there were people involved from both the right and the left, um, Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals. And I found that some of the senior people on both sides, if you got them after a couple of drinks, uh, would say to me, you know, the kids, we can't help these kids. We're babysitting these kids. We're babysitting these kids after second grade. Um, we're not actually serving them. And, and, and I know there are teachers in school districts and there are librarians in libraries who believe that too. And I think that is completely and utterly wrong. Uh, and, and, and I have a long experience with this. I'm probably, maybe, the oldest person in the room. Uh, and I've been doing this for a long time. And it's not the kids. It, it's our losing our sense of agency uh, in this that I think is the single biggest problem. There are lots of problems. School districts are problems themselves. Uh, money is a problem frequently, though it's probably less a problem than we sometimes think. Um, but, but the real problem is, is, is that we don't, when we find something that works, we don't do more of it. Um, and librarians know that. The, the, another takeaway from yesterday, I think, is uh, is how do we stop being transactional and be, you know, to use the big word transformative. I would say it's more it's more about continuous improvement. It's more about doing more of the things that we know are right. Um, and, and I would say, and, and, and Tim will will talk about this, um, and and I think in a very different way, Marianne will will talk about this. I think we, we have to focus on the things that make a difference. The, the, the key to not being transactional is to remember what makes a difference. And it tends to be, it is about the individual librarian or the individual teacher make, having an individual interaction uh, with, with the child, if, if children is what we're concentrated on. And, and, I, and I, we're gonna talk some about circulation in a minute. And, and I want to say one thing about circulation, um, and you know, we're talking about equity and equality. Not every circulation is equal. Not every circ is equal, and we know that. I think every librarian knows that. Um, you put a book in the hands uh, of a child that awakens their imagination, and that circulation uh, is transformative. Marianne will talk about that uh, uh, in, a, in a little while. And so the reading ecology, how we relate what we do in libraries to how we, how we work uh, with school districts, with how we work with reading groups, many of which are represented in the, uh, uh, in the audience and will be on our panels, uh, is important uh, to think about uh, today. I also heard what was said, uh, what Nicole said about um, library school and, and what Felton said about library school. And, uh, and, and library directors have had every ULC meeting, uh, every Knight Foundation meeting. Some, at some point in some corner of some room, there is the same discussion about library school. And so I wanna say this, two things. One, the IMLS um, in our new budget, should it ever pass, um, it should, should Congress get around to doing that? Uh, we've been on a continuing resolution now for almost six months. Uh, and I don't think any records have been set yet, but they, they're capable of it. Um, uh, in that budget, there, there is a new program, $5 million, that we're putting towards professional development program that is specifically designed uh, around equity and, uh, and, and producing in professional development uh, very, in various forms um, a more equitable pathway uh, an encouragement of a more equitable pathway, particularly for people of color, for, for people who come from backgrounds that most of us didn't come from. 
Uh, I think it's important that we begin to work with library schools, that the IMLS do this and groups like this uh, begin to work with library schools and talk about the nature of professional development, talk about the importance of the M uh, M MLS or MLIS, uh, uh, in the world and other potential pathways of professional development that don't involve uh, uh, immediate, uh, uh, excuse me, immediate move into uh, uh, postgraduate uh, education that don't necessarily take the time and money that can be mid-career, et cetera, and that focus on uh, the, uh, the equitable provision of that kind of advancement uh, so that the management levels uh, of our uh, libraries <clears throat> uh, can become uh, more like the rest of America. I think that I think that's important. I think we we, we have to talk begin talking about that uh, out of uh, out of this uh, meeting, uh, and we have we have some money at the IMLS to uh, to begin working on on that, and we can do uh, some convening around that. Um, I think at the end of today, um, I want to talk a little bit more about polarization. That obviously is a, a major topic and it's something that, that Bob and Shay Lynn talk about um, uh, very, very eloquently and how the I, we, I uh, 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 cycle in American history has taken us to a, a particularly bad place uh, today. Um, uh, I think I'm uniquely qualified. Uh, uh, because I'm a political appointee who was endorsed uh, by the, both the ALA and the Cato Institute, um, and, uh, uh, and that I've worked uh, successfully so far <clears throat> with that former president guy and uh, our current president, neither of whom I'm sure actually knew who I was, by the way. But, um, and I think uh, America 250, the 250th anniversary of the Declaration, um, will give us an opportunity uh, as, a, uh, as a profession as an industry uh, and, and as one of the trusted institutions uh, in America, as maybe the most trusted institution in America, uh, to, to talk about uh, polarization and to do something about polarization. As I say, I'll talk a little bit more at the, at the end uh, about that. Uh, anyway, uh, so I, I want to segue now to, uh, uh, to Tim uh, and, and what, we'll, uh, what, we'll, what he'll be talking about. Um, Tim Coates has had a fascinating career. Um, he, uh, it's a career uh, with books. God bless you uh, for that. Um, uh, he's been a marketing director uh, of uh, large retailers uh, in, in England, including Waterstones. Any, any of you who've traveled in England will know, know the name Waterstones. Uh, he was managing director of the UK uh, academic uh, division of Baker and Taylor, again, a company that uh, many of you know. He was been called the best bookseller uh, in England, uh, which uh, you know is a great title to uh, uh, to have. Um, he's testified before the House of Commons uh, uh, on on the subject of books and and, and literacy and uh, and libraries. He has a master's degree from a little university uh, north of London called Oxford, um, and he wants to grab you and me by the lapels and shake us up uh, and, and, and ask us um, if we know what we're doing. Do we really know what we're doing in the library world? His statistics, actually there are statistics, the IMLS statistics, he wants to take a look at those and ask us if we know what we're doing. Uh, he wants to share these statistics um, uh, uh, with, uh, with the IMLS and, and its uh, director uh, until some knowledge of the meaning and limitations of our st statistics might, might fall out of our heads. Um, he wants us to think more about our collections and their impact, uh, about our buildings and their use. Um, he's a little bit like the crazy uncle that you, know, you invite with trepidation uh, to uh, uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas dinner, um, he comes from across the pond uh, to uh, join our dinners uh, here, um, and, uh, and, and maybe when he gets up and leaves, mom and dad will sigh, a sigh of relief. Um, but you know something you're going to realize after you've heard what Tim has to say? Actually, Lisa and Rivka had dinner with him last night, and they came back converted. You know, it was, you know I, I thought the, the pod people had gotten them. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, after, after, he, after he's done, I think you will look at our numbers in a little bit different way. Um, and, and I think that's really important because again, as I said yesterday, I think there's an awful lot of inertial activity and inertial thinking uh, in the library world. Not unlike every other professional world, by the way, but it's, it's moments like this that we can, we can do something else. Um, so purpose uh, and perspective is what we're about here. And I would like to give you one perspective, one thing that uh, Tim, uh, uh, I think, ignores is the wrong word, but I think qualifies his perspective a little bit. Um, and it's this. The statistics that he'll show you are 2009 to 2018, mostly. Um, and that's exactly the life cycle of this, the iPhone. Uh, and I think that is the great externality of what we're talking about. It doesn't mean th that his, the statistics and what he says are any less important, or the perspective, but what we do about this, I mean, I, I've, I've said this before in, in, a, in a number of meetings, when I came to the library in 2005, the, the most interesting thing to me was the lines of kids, teenagers, particularly teenagers, the teenage, well, you, you know, before, before the late 90s, you wouldn't have seen teenagers in the library at all, right? Um, and, 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 uh, and particularly uh, kids of color, particularly, say, an African-American teenage male was probably the last person you would see uh, in a public library at 9 a.m. on Saturday morning. And yet, when I showed up to the library in 2005, they were lined up at our Blueford Library. And why was that? The use of computers. Um, by 2016 or 17, they weren't lined up anymore because of this. It's simply that true, I think. It's, simple. it's that simply true. Um, and I think we haven't done enough thinking about that. I think we all know this, and we all think about social media, and we all think about um, uh, reading online, et cetera, et cetera, but really it's about this. Uh, and so I would keep that in mind as you hear what Tim uh, has to say. Um, it is significantly about the nature of reading, in my view. Marianne will also talk about this. And so um, think today about the building as an asset and a liability, your buildings as an asset and a liability. Think about your collection as an asset that you focus on as a transformational asset, not simply as numbers, that not every circulation is equal, and that being mindful about this and intentional about this is really important. And so, ladies and gentlemen, Tim Coates and the Freckle Report. Thank you, Crosby. Now, where, where have you gone? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm very, very grateful. I'm, I'm grateful and would like to say how grateful I am because a, a year ago, it must be ne nearly now, I got this call completely out of the blue from someone of whom I, I confess I had never heard. And uh, then I worked out who he was. And he has been nothing but kind and interested in, in the things that, that I've been writing ever since that and and then of course it's wonderful to be able to come here that's that's very special i, I haven't been out the end of the street for two years never mind <laughs> so to be able to come here is special so thank you i, I mean it I, i'd also if i may like to thank catherine if she's if, she, if she's in the room and oh catherine for the arrangements that you and your colleagues have made because it makes a tremendous difference if, you know, if, if everything is done as nicely as, as it has been. So thank you. Thank you. I, I'm going to show you, oh, if I, may, I, may I just say first, can you all, I can't see what's on the screen yet. Can you, can, is there anyone who can't read what's on the screen? Because I, I, sh I shan't normally, yeah, I can see, yeah, thanks. I, I, I shan't normally 
speak or, or read out what's there. If you can read it, that, that's fine. That, that's, that's all I wanted to say. Okay, so I'm going to show you information which comes from three sources. The first, as Crosby says, is the IMLS own data, which they publish every year in, in magical spreadsheets, uh, huge spreadsheets, which are full of really, really important information. The second is a consumer survey, which was initiated three years ago, so therefore before the pandemic began, which is called Where Did You Get Your Book? And it starts by asking anybody who, who, will, who will answer, have you read or made use of a book in the, in the past year? And about 80% of Americans respond yes to that question. And that's consistent, we've done it three or four times now, and, that's, and in fact that number has risen during the pandemic. So more people, it appears, have been using or reading books. And it's a very big number. It's probably more than people who would say they'd watched a film, a movie, or had watched a TV series. So a lot of people read. That's very important to understand. Of that, of, of that 80 to 83%, about 15% got their most recent book from a, from a public library. So that's not a bad number, the 15%. But it shows the scale of what the library service does. It means that four out of five people who read don't get their books from the public library. And it therefore shows also, when we talk about non-users, which is a sort of librarian expression, we're not really talking about people who don't read or aren't interested in reading. We're predominantly talking about people who do read and are interested, but, but don't choose to use the library. And that's important too, because you'll find that a theme of what I'm going to say is about increasing use. And a lot of the increasing use we can get is from people who do actually read. The, the third source of information is, is the reports that that Crosby's been talking about. There are two, one called Freckle Report 20 and the other Freckle Report 21. And just to, so that you get a drift of, of, of what I say, I'll just read you from the paragraph right, right at the beginning of, of, the, of the more recent one. <clears throat> Throughout this report, there is great stress on the importance of reversing the decade-long reported decline in use of public library buildings and particularly of the printed work that they contain in all the countries, because I covered a number of countries. <clears throat> Sorry, my breath. <coughs> Both inside and outside the library service, there is a widespread sense that technology has made this inevitable. This author firmly believes this is not the case, that libraries provide universal free access to written material is a miraculous and brilliant idea of our ancestors. Technologies that have already found how to make material digital, to improve the ability to search and find, and to transform book supply chains, should all make the library service much more useful, not less. We just haven't found the way. The penalty for not addressing these matters quickly is that decline leads to closure, as we are already seeing in some places. But worse than closure is the truth that we will have deprived the generations that follow us of something that we all believe to be profoundly important. We can't do that. Could I have the next slide? Oh, I've got the slide, <laughs> excuse me. Somewhere here is the slide. Thank you. Here it is, just a minute. Here we go. It's been going on for 20 to 30 years that somehow 
somewhere, somebody decided that we should keep offering more services within public libraries. We feel it's the right thing to do. And the intention of it has to have been, it couldn't be anything else, that it would broaden the access of libraries to more people. But it hasn't worked. We rarely, almost never, hear anyone talk about the fact that reading is private. For a child to read a book, or for you to read a book, is a private thing to do. Reading is not a community activity. I know that there are reading groups, of course I do. But the point about reading is it is a private experience. And what the role of the library is, is to help that occur and, and take place and, 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 and for benefit to come from it. We hardly ever talk about that. We talk all about, all about the community activities and yet to a child the point is that they should read something. So these figures for the last 10 years they're exactly the same as the sheets which are on your table. Every single year, oh, thank you, oh, thank you, thank you. It, that, it means that at the end of each year, nobody looked. The, the green are print circulations, and the, and the yellow are, or the, are digital circulations. By 2019, we had invested oceans of money in, in digital, in digital um, licenses. Oceans. In-house, this expression that I've used here simply means I've extracted the things, the library services that take place, as, as Cosby would say, on the phone, that you don't have to go into the library to do. The largest of all is, is borrowing books. You'll see some, some, fixes, some figures about that in a moment. But none of, none of the other activities come anywhere near making up for the fall, for the fall in use of the buildings that has arisen from the fall in circulation of print books. Year after year, this is, these are of course average, which means that there are some which are better and some which are worse. But year after year, nobody's noticed. Children's books too. And as Pat Luzinski will tell you, I think, is that it, it can be understood that most of these figures are, are probably actually worse than, than the graph shows because they get reported a bit high, but that's, I'm not going to get into that. You can. <laughs> so our, our job of helping children to find what they would like to read has not been successful. Here's the point that Crosby was making that there was a time when there was very limited access to the internet and the libraries performed, but that has gone down. So you couldn't now build an operation on the base of using free access to the internet in the libraries. People say to me, oh, you don't understand, it doesn't happen in my place. It does. Those figures are fall, there are falls in every single state, every single state. <coughs> And in they have also falls in every single of the 70 largest libraries in the country. I went through them all. They're all they're listed in this report. And it's not just a number. If, if use is falling, it means that certain families no longer go to the library. 
It means people no longer use the, li the library as a dependable place to go. All the things we talk about, trust, doesn't, don't apply to an increasing number of people. And nobody does anything about it. And it's not because there's no money. The American Public Library Service has over $13 billion a year, and the, and the amount is rising. And we, haven't seen, we haven't seen the most recent figures, but up until 2019 it was rising. Every year there's no reason to think it won't. So, okay, I'm sure that there are places where, where, where money is short. Of course there are. But in totality, you cannot blame the politicians for not giving you enough money. Interesting on this graph, the green is the staff cost. The little lines in the middle, the blue and the... And the, the that's the material budget in the middle. Just see how small it is compared to the amount of money available. It's less than 10% in total. And of that, a, a, a fraction of it is spent on print materials. So people could rightly say, but you have all this money, and the thing that we all come for are materials, so why do you spend so little? And of, of what you do spend, why does so much of it go to some wholesalers who take the you know, best part of half of it? There's the, there's the spend on print material. And, the, and your, the sheet on your table actually shows that over 20 years, the spend on print material has gone, has gone down by a lot. But this is what people come for. Can you imagine a store doing that? And there the yellow is the, the digital spend. And what a huge portion of the total spend it, it had become by, time, by 2019. Remembering that digital circulation was less than 10% of the total. We've added a lot of services, but nobody asked us to. Except ourselves. This slide is really important. It's probably the most important in the deck. It's the, it comes from this consumer survey we've done. This is, it, we've done it now three times. So all, they all say exactly the same thing. It completely ties up with any other consumer survey that you would see. And the question that asked is, when you, in this instance, is when you last visited the library, what did you go for? 85% of library visits are either for reading, borrowing books, reading books, sitting or sitting and studying. So when we talk about traditional and progressive, which are difficult words because they've been used in the education sector and become, come to mean very little. What people want in the library service are books and somewhere to, come, somewhere to sit and work and study at all ages. We haven't been looking at the data and we're managers, and we're managing a lot of public money. So we have to do something about it. And my solutions are really simple. It's the reputation that matters. Not circulation, they, don't, they, they, they come second. What matters is re-establishing the reputation as being a place that, the, that will provide what you want to read. It's reading that changes lives, not libraries. It's reading that would enable a generation of teenagers to do the transformation we were talking about yesterday. And they would do it, and we believe that they should, because they read. The transformation doesn't come because they come into the library. It comes because they will have read something that will help them. That's a picture I want. When I talk about library collections, I don't just mean you have to buy the right things. You have to display them properly. You have to keep complete series. You have to have plenty of copies, new copies, of all the things that people want. And we don't do that.
We are not going to increase the use of libraries by, by programs. It's not going to happen. Because that's just a statement of arithmetic. The collections need to be diverse. I took Dr. Sarah somewhere. He, she would talk to telling us yesterday how the importance of, of the diverse ethnicity, ethnicity of the collections is so important. And it's the one thing that libraries can do that nobody else can do because they work in small communities. And more backlist. So 90, no, nobody believes, but 90% of what people read is, what, is not the stuff that has just been published. It's stuff that's been around a long time. You have to replenish the backlist collections with new copies of things. It's basic stuff. Here's a nice display of a, of, a, of a children's section in a bookshop to show you that you don't need green dinosaurs made of fluffy cloth to attract children into a into a life. What you need are very attractive uh, displays like this, face out, using the illustrations that the publishers have put on the books. Kids love that. That's absolutely, that's heaven. So I have three recommendations, really. We have to measure better and we have to pay attention to the measurements that we have. We need to spend more money and more con concentrate more on diversifying and, and improving the quality of the print book collections. And then we have to make sure that we do use those things to increase the, the use of the libraries. And we have to do it quickly. Thank you, Tim, and, and that sets the stage for a, a response, a speed response, we're, we're calling it, uh, from, uh, uh, from three of our uh, uh, panelists uh, who I want to introduce now. Um, and let me get my introduction here. Um, uh, so Jenny Garner, uh, who is the library director in uh, North Liberty, uh, Iowa, the North Liberty a Library, uh, a place that she's been for uh, 25 years. Six is the director, uh, who is an advocate for rural libraries and the president-elect of the Association of Rural and Small Libraries, ARSL. Um, yeah, uh, she's also involved with the Iowa City UNESCO City of Literature Executive Board, uh, the Iowa Library Association, um, and uh, uh, focused on uh, social justice uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and uh, Jenny is over here. Okay, and they're going to be doing this from their from their seats at the at the table. Um, uh, Pat Lasinski, I can't believe this is true, but I'm reading this in in Pat's bio that he actually has been the director of the Columbus Library since Columbus founded Columbus in 1492. <laughs> No, no, I'm sorry, 2002. He's been the, been the director since, since uh, uh, 2002. Um, uh, Columbus uh, CEO ma magazine has named him CEO of, uh, of the year. Uh, Columbus Business Circle Award for the Most Admired uh, Executive. Uh, University of Wisconsin High School Distinguished Alumnus Award. We go on and on and on with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, his, uh, his um, uh, encomia. Uh, Pat has been a leader in the uh, in the library world. I think everybody here knows knows that, um, and he's Pat is way over there, table five. Uh, Kelvin Watson. Kelvin has already taken some hits uh, today, uh, yesterday. Kelvin is uh, is over here. Uh, he's he's run uh, some of the largest libraries in the in the world. He's currently running the Las Vegas Library with its 25 branches and 77 million dollar uh, uh, budget. Um, and uh, he's received a number of awards as well. Uh, Broward County Library, when he was running it, was uh, named the Library of the, uh, of the Year in, in, uh, in Florida, uh, and he was the uh, COO of the, of the uh, Queens Library. Uh, and and uh, you know, he's, he, uh, he, he was a commissioned officer in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Army, and he uh, uh, has had a, a life outside of the library world, but in the library world, but from the from the commercial side, working for for Ingram uh, uh, and uh, 
uh, and others. So he brings a, a particularly unique perspective, I think, uh, on on things. So, um, so Terry, you want to put this together? So we have a slightly different format than yesterday. Each of our respondents will have two minutes to stand from their seats and respond to Tim's presentation. And then Tim will have two minutes to respond at the end of those remarks. And then um, Crosby will come back up and introduce our next keynote and we'll sort of start the cycle again. So with that, um, can I call on Kelvin? We'll go, we'll go down the line here. So Kelvin, Jenny, and Pat. All right, hot mic. Good morning, everyone. So, uh, so I've had the opportunity to talk to Tim a couple of times uh, when he uh, issued the first Freckle report. So, some of the things that I'll say is that you know my background also is in bookstores. So I worked for Borders, and Borders, as you recall, had lots of programs. So I would say that was one way that we actually drove actually tr people into the bookstores. It was not just about; it wasn't totally about the reading, as you know, but it was also the programmatic aspects as well. And that's a similar approach that I use in, um, in uh, libraries. And so in Broward County, the reason that we were Florida Library of the Year is because we actually increased not only our circulation, but we also had the programmatic aspects as well. So I, I, I think that, you know, um, for our, our roles, leveraging our resources both inside and outside the library, right, increase people's awareness of libraries. We put digital libraries on 400 buses in Las Vegas. Increased library card holders, increased circulation. Again, it's, it's, it's leveraging those, that the resources, all of the resources. Um, working directly with school students with programs like Community Share, where we're delivering electronic books directly to the student in, on their, at their desktop, right? So, these are, uh, my two minutes are up. <laughs> oh, oh, the wrap up is 30 seconds. Okay, in 30 seconds, what I will say is that um, programs and the services and the, the, the libraries being the community hubs can drive marketing of the library, increasing people coming in. That's what my perspective is. Well, I'll just, Kelvin said it, I'm done. No, um, I was gonna start with this. Um, I think it's also about impact. It's not all about the numbers. The numbers are great and we need them and we're not great at collecting them. We talked about this yesterday at our table. Um, I'm gonna tell you a really quick story about a young girl who came to a poetry night that I had when I was a teen librarian. Um, I was a teenager when I started 25 years ago. Um, who we had a program and I was really excited because we had a pretty good turnout for most of our teen programs and this particular one was a poetry slam and I was so excited to do it for the first time and we had 10 people and I was like, oh, bummer, this is so sad. And the next day, a mom called me and she said, I wanna thank you. My daughter has been dealing with depression and suicidal thoughts and your program meant so much to her and it changed my way of thinking. I had an impact. So every day in our library where I work, where we have 20,000 people in our town, I've worked in three libraries all in North Liberty because I started in a library that was 1,200 square feet. And 10 years later, we built a 6,400 square feet library. And 10 years later, we built an 18,000 square foot library. I worked with three people when I started. I now have 20 employees under me. So our library is growing. Our library is growing fast. Our community is growing fast. Our circulation numbers are pretty good. Um, they're not where I'd want them to be. And of course, after COVID, we know that libraries are resilient and we know that libraries respond to what the community needs. I turned from going into the community and saying, here's what I have to give you, to going to the community and saying, what is it you need from us and how can we help you? And I think that is one of the solid answers. And the other is marketing, as Kelvin brought up, but how do I, we as small libraries leverage that when we don't have the funds? So our uh, favorite, Uncle Tim, gives us that gloomy report and then says, Pat Lasinski says it's worse. 
Thanks, Tim. I can't wait for the staff development day speaking invitations to flood my mailbox after that one. Um, but actually, it's true. And um, I think what, what Tim really hits on is the brand of libraries still being books. When you see that 70% number, it's a big deal. We don't talk enough about it. OCLC did a series of reports over the last decade that confirmed it's books, it's books, it's books. So that's our brand. And so we need to think about what the story is if that's not the brand moving forward. Um, good news is, uh, and, and first of all, why is it worse? Because we were certainly one of the libraries that early adopters to get rid of fines, fine free. Many of us also put in automated um, renewal. Why hold the book on the shelf if the customer can keep it in their home for a couple of more weeks? So what you're seeing here, I, our library actually has 10 renewals. And I know of plenty of the libraries that have five renewals. So what you're seeing here is all of the circulation when what you should look at in your library is first time circulation. Because all the others are circulations of convenience not actually new circulation. So the numbers are actually much worse. Um, and it's sort of the law of unintended consequences of the fine free. People no longer have to come in to the library for another visit where we could hook them with new material. So it's an interesting thing that's happened. On the good side, during the pandemic, our job was a whole lot easier than museums because we had a product that people could come in and get from their car. On the bad side, that is no longer kind of where our future is. And um, if I have one criticism of Tim's report is that it focuses on inputs and outputs. And as elusive as they are, I think our real opportunity is to talk about community-based outcomes that we can be a part of. Um, but that will be part of uh, my remarks when I'm up on stage. Thank you. I, I, can I I'll go here? Yeah. Can, can you? Okay. Um, thank you very much, mm. Calvin. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, of those points, I would like to address one particularly. When people look at these numbers, they it's frequently say to me, it's the impact that you don't seem to understand. The impact is on the people who use the service. And the measurement of it is whether they choose to use the service again. So if the use of the service is going down, the impact has been negative. So, I mean, for years I've heard people say, it's all about impact, we need impact measures. No one can ever produce impact measures, but the real measure of impact is how much people use the library service. That's the answer to that point. That's, that's what. So I do, I do have one thought um, or um, uh, point to, to make about the, the statistics that you see at the tables. Um, one of the things uh, that I thought would be useful to know, I mean, I think everything that Tim has said, uh, Pat, Pat's point about um, the re circulation renewal uh, is true. Uh, one of my heroes, Waller McGuire, will uh, remember him, uh, was a guy named Carl Sandstedt who ran the uh, St. Charles Library. And St. Charles was a growing suburban community. And uh, Carl explained to me uh, how to manipulate uh, circulation statistics. And he, he was one of the very, very early adopters of the automatic renewal, number one. Um, and number two, he said, make sure, I don't know if you remember the Hapler statistics, pre, predated uh, library journal statistics, et cetera. But um, Hapler uh, thing was based on, you, you, you gave them your census data, your previous, previous census data, uh, and, they, and they judged the circulation on that. And Carl realized that, um, uh, that that was the denominator and the numerator, if you were in a, a fast growing area, was growing really quickly and the de denominator wasn't growing. So he looked really great for nine years. And he said, I'm gonna retire in the 10th year, and he did. Um, 
So, so the point of the statistics um, uh, that I asked Matt Birnbaum in our uh, research and evaluation area to, to put together is to go back beyond uh, 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 Tim's starting date to 1990. I think if you look at these statistics, um, they look, it, it's flatter. There, there's no, it's not so much a decline, it's flat. Though I think, again, what Tim and Pat have both, both said would, would point out that the statistics still actually are, are, are pretty bad. Uh, but I wanted to give some context to that. So now, uh, Tony uh, Age, I want, I want to introduce, and I want to, um, I think uh, what Pat said about the books being the, the brand uh, is, is important here. I had this conversation that I mentioned before with, uh, with Tony, Luke Swarthout, um, and uh, Marcellus Turner, MT, was, uh, was part of that conversation too. Uh, is he here? Did he come? Is he? There he is. There he is. Um, and uh, uh, MT's version of that was the word what? He said, what is the what uh, of libraries? Well, the brand is books. And Tony's, Tony's statement was that he, here is this guy who is producing, is a digital guru, and he's producing a bookless library. And what is a bookless library? Is that really a library? Um, and, and you know, he said this uh, with a certain amount of uh, awe and shock. And, uh, and, and it's, it's, it stayed in my mind in a big way. Um, Tony Marks brought Tony Age to the New York Public Library, um, uh, telling him that it um, was even larger than the Queen's Library. And Tony, Tony said, but the Queen's Library is mainly about books about corgis. <laughs> sorry, I hope they, sorry. One bad joke, that's all I really, just one bad joke. Uh, Tony, uh, Tony had an incredible career uh, in, in England uh, as a chief technical officer or some, some similar title at The Guardian uh, and at the, at the BBC, where he increased the, the BBC's uh, web traffic from 2 million to 25 million in five years. Um, and at the New York Public Library, many of you know, uh, he, he's uh, expanded the reach of the digital universe dramatically and uh, strategically. Um, uh, in, in my in a number of conversations that I, I've had with Tony, I'm very impressed with uh, not not only the the uh, uh, the attempts of the New York Public Library to reach people digitally who have not been reached. One of the, uh, the the activities that we're involved in the IMLS is helping the New York Public Library fund uh, is, is a uh, a radio frequency uh, uh, attempt to get through the big buildings in uh, in New York. Uh, create Wi-Fi with uh, radio frequency, um, and uh, something that's also been used in rural areas. Utah school district has uh, has used it. Creativity uh, in in reaching people is, I think, what to Tony's all about. But also, uh, as the pandemic started, Tony Marks, uh, many of you will have seen, wrote a, a uh, an editorial, an op-ed in the New York Times, in which he said everything that we know and Tim is talking about is the huge increase in, in, in digital circulation that we saw at the beginning of the pandemic and continued through the pandemic and continues to this day. Um, and I was talking to, to Tony about that. And the problem with the increase in digital circulation um, is it is the same people who were using digital circulation before. It wasn't new people at all. Um, and it's certainly not people on the other side of all of our divides, the, the digital divide to begin with, but all the other divides we have in this country, we're not reaching with the digital, we're not reaching the people who need the library's help, the school district's help, uh, the help of government, the help of all of us, uh, if we're talking about equity uh, in this country. So Tony, Tony to me is asking all the right questions uh, and, and he comes at it obviously from a different point of view, uh, from the digital point of view, from the, per, from the point of view of the person who is creating the bookless library, the, uh, the digital library. So, Tony. making that mistake. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you, Grosby, uh, IMLS, for convening this discussion. Uh, thank you, Kelvin, uh, Jenny, and uh, Pat, for joining this discussion. I hope your questions and responses are going to be uh, uh, 
gentle. And thanks to everybody else for being here. So yeah, my name is Tony Aggie. I'm Chief Digital Officer for the New York Public Library. Uh, at NYPL, I'm concerned with the digital transformation of the library, and I also oversee a design and engineering team that helps develop, operate, and evaluate uh, many of the digital services that are used by our patrons. A large part of that work is concerned with ebooks and their impact on our branch libraries and our research libraries. So Crosby has asked me to speak on this panel to see if ebooks have anything to say to Tim's hypothesis. It's a tricky question. Uh, I'm personally very interested to hear what you all have to say about the Freckle Report, and in particular the opinions of our distinguished panel. Um, and of course, I've had to construct this presentation without hearing anybody else speak. So here's what I've done. For the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to take Tim's hypothesis seriously and ask if Tim is correct and American libraries are facing a challenge as the result of differing perspectives on the importance of brick and mortar buildings and our physical books, if that is the problem, then can e-books be a solution? So my answer to that question is a qualified no. I believe e-books do have an important role to play in the service of public libraries, but as presently constituted, our e-book services could not have prevented the decline that Tim describes in the British libraries and is unlikely to reverse a similar trend in the US libraries should it manifest. So before I explain too much more, I want to give a brief introduction about myself to those of you I uh, haven't met. I joined NYPL about six years ago. Before that, my career had been in the UK, almost exclusively, as uh, Crosby said, for major, now global media companies, in particular Guardian newspapers and the BBC. For the last 20 years or so, I've been primarily concerned with helping organisations such as those understand the ways in which digital technology was changing not just their operations, but their entire businesses. Uh, I helped The Guardian understand why it would have to build an online up-to-the-minute news and information service, and I explained to the BBC why people would expect to be able to be free to watch their television programmes at times that suited them, not the schedulers, uh, on demand. Now, these may seem very silly conversations here in 2022, but in 1994 and 2003, I can assure you, uh, they involved very long, complicated, and um, shouty uh, discussions <laughs> <laughs> before a consensus could be achieved. Uh, at the same time, I managed teams of staff who imagined, built, delivered some of their digital services used by, I don't know, readers, viewers, audiences, what we would call patrons. And my role at the library, NYPO, is similar. But one final thing I want to, I want to say, I often say this, uh, my title is Chief Digital Officer, and I think of the term digital in my title in much the same way that firemen thinks of the word fire in theirs. I'm not trying to spread it. Uh, I'm not here to, be a, 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 to promote digital or to be an advocate for digital technology. I am here to ensure that the digital technology we use can be understood, the good, the bad, and everything in between, and then harnessed to help my library be, a, be successful as a library. Uh, fire can generate light uh, and heat, uh, but if you simply let it loose in the library, it will destroy it. And I am concerned that digital technology is capable of doing much the same. Now, American libraries, public libraries, sorry, today, have had more than a decade of experience of licensing and serving e-books to their patrons. At this point, I think we can start to draw some conclusions. So here are three things that we observe e-books currently do to the New York Public Library. They, re they reduce foot traffic to our 88 uh, neighbourhood libraries, they place pressure on the print and physical materials budget, and they separate the patron from our staff and from their neighbours. So observation one, e-books currently reduce visits to the libraries. But we all understand that e-books allow libraries to deliver a virtual facsimile of our service without needing to come to the building. That is in itself not a bad thing. And during the early days of the pandemic, this was a massive feature. We could be closed, many patrons could still be reading books from their library. 
And actually, even before COVID, many of our patrons chose to read e via e-books rather than through the print collection. That means they no longer need to come to the library. And seen through Tim's lens in this change in foot traffic, uh, this is both a flaw and a feature. So I want to borrow something from digital platform theory and try to apply it back to our physical libraries. Uh, in this uh, very fine book, the authors describe one type of digital platform as a transaction platform. I think we should call that the T word, I think. Uh, think of Amazon's Marketplace or, or Airbnb or Uber. On one side you have producers, on the other side consumers, in the middle is the platform. So the product may change, uh, the available places to stay might change, the drivers can change, but the consumer always comes back to the platform because they can rely on it to meet their buy-in, rent-in, ride-in needs. There's tremendous value and power in being this type of transactional platform. Now, to me, public libraries behave a lot like community-based transactional platforms. They sit between the authors and services and the patrons. We don't write, publish, print the books ourselves. Uh, and while we put on many of the programs, we also regularly bring in community members, elected officials, authors to do the programs. And though the books and the programs change, the library is a constant that people can turn to in their community. There's a fundamental formula which is often used as a shorthand that uh, the value of a network is equal to the number of connections among users squared. So each additional user you add to the network creates exponential value. If you think of the library as a platform, uh, then ebooks driving down the visits to the library is driving down the value of the platform. And the reasons are obvious. A patron comes to the library to look for a book, they can discover something else the library is offering. Uh, they might be dragging along a kid uh, only for the child to discover a book, or vice versa. And if a patron doesn't come to the library, they can't see their neighbour. They aren't meeting on the street outside the library, or in the parking lot, or enlivening the space, or marking the library as a critical hub for the community. Now, I'm not suggesting that this flaw outweighs the value of e-books, but if we are concerned about declining visits to libraries, well, e-books are not helping. Uh, observation two, e-books place pressure on collections budgets. Well, my good colleague, Bill Kelly, who runs our research libraries, tells, in, talks increasingly about how he's having to run two businesses on a single budget, continuing physical one and an ever-growing digital one. And some of you may be in organizations that have allocated additional resources to fund the expanding ebook services on top of your print collection. And if that's the case, uh, then disregard this point and meet me observation three in a minute or two. But uh, from day one at the New York Public Library, our ebook license costs were wedged into our single collections budget. And that budget has been largely flat for the past decade, which means that ebook licenses and audio licenses are coming at the expense of something else. Uh, DVDs perhaps at first, but increasingly it's from print books. And that means fewer printed copies on our shelves. This is particularly significant for the 50% of our readers who only ever discover their book by browsing. Now we shouldn't be surprised if a reduced collection means less reward in browsing, which leads to less satisfied patrons and some choosing not to come back. So absent a big pot of new money, for ebooks, I don't know uh, how we resolve that challenge easily, although I do want to share a couple of things that we've done at NYPL to stop it getting worse. The first is that we've now separated our print budget or our print book budget and our ebook budget. Uh, these are different businesses, and we should evaluate our ebook services as we do our physical library services, rather than just isolate the size and the marginal cost of the ebook collection. Otherwise, we're in danger of stripping our shelves of books while retaining all of the surrounding overheads and other costs. The second mitigation is something we put in place on March 15th, 2020. That was the first Monday after our physical shutdown. We changed our ebook checkout and hold limits from 1515 to three and three. Now we'd been thinking about that for a while because we realized that when the library started offering ebook services, we simply imported our borrowing and holds rules from the physical library, despite the fact that the patron use cases were totally different. 
Uh, a patron visiting a physical branch might only come once a week or once every couple of weeks. Uh, they might be borrowing for family members or neighbours. Um, they might be borrowing children's books or they might be a student doing a report. Whatever, any of those reasons would justify a higher borrowing limit. But the e-book service we provide was overwhelmingly used by adults doing recreational reading rather than, say, research. For most of our patrons, getting, getting to the free Wi-Fi uh, to download their next e-book was actually closer than getting to their local branch, Starbucks or wherever. So what's worse uh, is that our holds limit were encouraging patrons to play games. They were placing lots of holds in the hopes of finding something good uh, as it became available. By lowering our borrowing and holds limits, we were able to accommodate, during COVID, uh, over 150,000 new e-book users during these past two years without raising our budget or taking money away from other services to retain those new users now that the branches are reopening. Now, on an average day, our e-book users are still up 20-25% over the, the pre-pandemic numbers, but our overall circulation, and therefore our spending, is flat. We suspect, although we don't have data, that this change may actually have improved overall patron satisfaction, because less game playing, more reading. Oh, by the way, echoing everything everyone's said so far, if you ever need an example about optimising for circulation leads to perverse incentives, since the change we're serving more patrons with more books at lower cost per reader, but I still regularly feel the question, why didn't you make overall circulation go up? Observation three, e-books disconnect patrons from our staff and from their neighbours. Okay, so mindful of time, I'm just going to leave this one here for discussion by others. But uh, if, uh, if one values, one of the values of a public library is in helping to develop and support our local communities by connecting our patrons to each other and to our staff, e-book services, as we currently provide them, don't do that. So... We observe e-books lead to less foot traffic, budgetary difficulties, patrons disconnected from the libraries. But what about all the good things we get from e-books? More users, more reading, more circulation, less hassle for the patrons. Where are the advantages of e-books in this presentation? And doesn't all of this offset the downside of e-books? Yeah, maybe. Frankly, I don't actually know. I think that's for you to discuss. But I would point out that the actual libraries that you all represent individually and collectively do not deliver currently very much, if any value, through the e-book services we currently pay for. We all, NYPR included, rely on vendors to provide our e-book services. Our primary function in the library e-book ecosystem today is to provide money. Uh, yeah, we do some selection and we put in book lists, but I think the role that libraries currently play in reflecting the tastes and needs of their communities and shaping their e-book services pales in comparison to the service design and delivery that happens in any one of the 17,000 branch libraries every single day across the country. So where does that leave us? Uh, I think there is a strong case that e-books are an important part of, a, of a, a robust public library service now and into the future. I haven't talked about it here, but we know that some patrons with accessibility challenges are much better served by e-books and by audiobooks than print books. E-books are probably the single biggest service innovation in libraries in the past decade from the perspective of the patrons. But the current model of e-book service that has evolved during the same decade is in tension with the physical library as a community platform. And if you believe that Tim may have identified a problem facing public libraries, then I don't believe that e-books alone, as we currently offer them, will be the solution. Thank you. Do you want me to step down or shall I wait here? Stay here. Thank you so much, Tony. Now we're going to have our panelist responses again, another two-minute response from each of our um, table panelists, and then a two-minute response to that from Tony. And then we're going to switch up the format a little bit. I'll say a few announcements before we go to break, and, um, and then we'll continue. So.
Calvin, would you like to start us off again? Please. So that was interesting, uh, having been a, a digital officer at Queens Library as well. Uh, and, you know, I know Tony. So I actually agree that eBooks probably is not the solution, but it's something that we've had to provide our diverse communities, their diverse meeting their diverse needs. I think that we, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know what I've been able to do, and I'll use some practical experiences from the libraries that I've that I've led. It's really you know figuring out that this is a hard pro you know problem. That's why we're here discussing it, right? So there is no one solution, but we've at public libraries have had to be unique unicorns, driving people in to the libraries in different manners, right? So one of the things that I looked at when we were having decreased um, when we open our buildings. The, the foot traffic was down, right? People coming in the building. So looking at how can we partner with our stakeholders to offer classes with uh, the College of Southern Nevada to bring a, a new people into our buildings so that they can be exposed to the library. So I agree, I agree with Tony, eBooks is not the solution, but it is a way that we can continue to introduce people to the library in different manners. I mean, that's again, the, way, the, way, the reason that I did the bus project in Las Vegas was to introduce people who in, in the community were not coming into the library. We actually increased our library card holders in a month by 7,000 new library card holders. We also let the visitors in the community also access those eBooks as well. So again, um, the, the licensing models, they're, they're, no, they're definitely no good. We know that from the large publishers, but you also need to look at the increased number of titles that are being published outside of those large publishers as well. So that's another opportunity for libraries also. So I think I'm done. <laughs> So I think what Tony's saying holds a lot of truth. When we're stretching our dollars to, to provide all the services that we're providing in our communities, how do we do that with, um, with lower budgets or smaller budgets? Our book budget is much smaller than many, many of you in, the, in this room. Um, our book budget is $60,000. Our ebook budget is $30,000. But our ebook collection is much bigger because I partner. I partner with our neighboring libraries. I collaborate um, in any way I can to stretch those dollars. And that's what I think we have to continue doing in order to engage our communities and be out, about, out in the public. Outreach is a really important part of what we do every day. I, my goal in North Liberty is for people to recognize me when I walk out of the door. Um, they don't recognize me in the library because I'm in my office all the time. But when I'm out in the community, those people know me. They know who I am and they come to us looking for things and they ask us, well, what do we need? Well, uh, let me tell you what I can do for you at the library. You tell me what you need and we'll make it happen. So those are how we um, continue to thrive. Libraries are resilient and responsive and we always have been. We've been partnering since the 1900s, early 1900s, 100 years ago. Duluth and Butte um, both partnered with their Red Crosses during the pandemic during the influenza pandemic. So we know from the, this pandemic and the one 100 years ago, libraries reflect what their communities need and we continue to do those things. That's why we'll continue to thrive. I truly believe that. And I do think eBooks have their place and I, I'm so glad to hear what you said about the eBooks, um, Tony, and I don't, I don't have any mean words for you. Um, <laughs> I love what you said. Um, Ebooks do have their pay place and books have their place and sometimes people want to just have the books in their home so they either keep our books and they don't return them, which is okay with me. I'm okay with that. That's part of doing business or they buy them um, if they can afford to buy them. Hello? Okay, now I have 30 seconds. Um, so I'm gonna try to uh, 
uh, bridge Tim and Tony just a little bit because part of what Tim suggests in his recommendation to buy more materials is that somehow we're not meeting demand. And I think, you know, I look at what we spend on extra copies and holds and all of the rest, and I'm, I, I'm not sure that the answer is spending more money on materials. Um, you know, the pandemic, I'm going back to that again, the disruption um, has created so many other channels to obtain content beyond libraries, which I think is a big hurdle for us moving forward. And I mentioned last night, I, I never envisioned that we would buy four or five streaming services per month and pay. I just did not see that future um, 10 and 15 years ago. When Tony says, um, you know, 150,000 more ebook users during that period of time, um, that sounds great to me, but one of the questions we try to ask locally, is that a good number? So compared to how much market penetration, um, you know, how are we actually doing? How many of you, just curious, um, show of hands, if you're in a public library, do you know about how many library card holders you have? Most of you. Do you know how many of those library card holders have ever streamed an ebook? Do you know that? Hey, show of hands. Couple. So our selectors who buy ebooks didn't know that. And uh, for us, out of 650,000, it's 50,000. So they say to ourselves, is that a good number? And if you go a little bit deeper, you start to see those 50,000. This isn't a big surprise, but it's an insight about our work you find that the people in areas where we don't have broadband service, which is about 50,000 homes in central Ohio, are not able to download those materials. So it gives us insight into where we might be headed. Um, I, I think the principle that we have around confidentiality of customer data has held us back. And we have confused that principle with using deep aggregate analysis of the data to understand where our opportunities lie. And um, I think we have an opportunity to make a lot of progress in that arena. Yeah, so unfortunately, I think I agree with everything, <laughs> everything everybody said, so that's not gonna work well. But I would say a couple of comments. So first of all, Jenny, it's a, uh, um, in particular, but people exactly like you who think the way you do and act the way you do. It's a genuine honor and a privilege to work with you, and I believe that I work in service of you. Um, so carry on doing what you're doing, and I will do everything I can to support you. Speaking, uh, I think Pat is right, data, analysis, information. Um, one of the um, things that I um, am good at um, is uh, I'm, I'm willing to ask questions, I'm willing to interrogate something. I'm not so good at the answers, but I definitely know when we've got the wrong answer. I'm not saying anything here for this room, but I'm saying, you know, ask questions, look at your data, don't be scared to ask, and don't be scared to find an answer you don't like to look at, and then, you know, take action. Uh, Kelvin, um, thank you. He was one of the very first people ever to extend a welcoming hand to me when I first arrived six years ago. Uh, I've been watching your work uh, from afar. Well, not always from afar, but increasingly from afar. Uh, what I think about Kelvin is one, he's a pioneer. He's somebody who is willing to try a new service, willing to take something on, but also what I've seen him do is he analyzes it, he learns from it, and decides whether he needs to adjust it, drop it completely, or keep going. So I would say um, thank you for letting me speak today. Don't disagree with anybody, but keep up the good work. All right, uh, Tony is gonna lead our discussion. This is sort of what we had yesterday where each of the library practitioners had 10 minutes to respond um, with more substantive remarks. The format may be a little different, more of a facilitated discussion. We'll leave that up to Tony and his colleagues. Uh, but we have 30 minutes to go through this portion and you can continue to feed questions to your IMLS note takers. We will have the Q&A eventually, um, but we'll do a, a table activity after we wrap up with the panel. So Tony, take it away. Thank you, can you hear me? So thank you all, I'm gonna do my best to uh, open up a, a conversation from these guys. I think if there are questions from uh, the floor, please uh, uh, make yourself known. I think there are microphones that will roam around. Um, I'm going to start the first question, unfortunately, to you, Kelvin. I hope you don't mind. Uh, I said uh, at the mic, uh, this guy has a 
history of innovation and doing new things, and I think uh, that sounds like a bold claim, so if you don't mind, I'm going to put you on the spot. I think you have a history, I know you have a history of rolling up your sleeves, trying new things, particularly with e-books. Could you give us some examples of things that you've tried that have worked? Some of the things that I've tried that, uh, that worked and I've learned from, is what, as, as Tony mentioned earlier. So when I was in Broward County, uh, we put in a bookless library at the Fort Lauderdale Hollywood Airport. So it's still, it's still there between terminals three and four. And so the assumptions were, uh, before you look deep dive into the data, was that, oh, we're going to have everybody that's traveling through the airport, we're gonna be poor, right? We're gonna run out of money and because of all of the people getting e-books. But what we found from the data was that actually we had more people uh, who lived in Broward County actually not only having the opportunity to get an, a, a library card, but also they were the primary users of the content. Only 2% of the visitors who didn't live in Broward County were actually using, uh, using the service as well as not really using the content as they were coming through the, through the airport. Other ideas I mentioned earlier was the buses, which is something that I, Columbus will be doing soon. Um, and so we have digital access to not just a library card, but to content on the 400 buses in Las Vegas. So that was out of a partnership. Um, you know, it's hot and dusty in uh, Nevada, as you know. Um, but we did pop-up libraries in Broward. And so I'm testing these types of hypotheses and seeing Num number one, who is going to be actually using it? Is it going to be visitors? And so I, I typically open it up to everybody, right? So that you don't have to, you know, um, you can actually see are the people who live in the community going to use these resources versus the, the, the visitors. So the same with buses. We open it up to the visitors. Same, same results, right? Minimal use of the visitors, really people from the community leveraging those. And so bookless libraries, uh, we have one coming um, in Mesquite, Nevada. It's, a, it's gonna be an all STEAM related bookless library location. So we're opening that up as well. So um, to Tony's point, I, I, I like trying new things with, with e-books, e-resources, uh, hospitals, uh, seaports. When I was in Broward, we put, you know, we had some out, outreach at, uh, at the seaports as well. So. Um, Again, nothing is beyond the imagination if you, you know, just, it's just about experimentation and, and really finding out how people are gonna use the, the e-books and what that traffic is gonna be like coming into the actual physical library. Thank you, can, so any, if anybody has a, a follow-up question for Kelvin, if you can um, make yourself known, uh, I'll ask him that. In the meantime, Jenny, can I just ask you a quick question? Sure. So Tim suggests that libraries should simply buy more print books. And Pat answered that, um, I think, quite um, candidly. What's your thought? I mean, I agree with Pat. I don't think that is the answer. I think um, what we need to look at is our model um, and our brand. Like we said, you know, our, what, if you want to call it our tagline at North Liberty is experience your library. And what I mean by that is every person who comes in the door is their library. And I want every person who comes in to feel that they belong by nature not because we're welcoming them, but because it's the place for them to be and to thrive and to do what they need to do, um, whatever that is. And many of them are reading and many of them are coming in to check out books and we have a pretty good model of um, when I started at the library, we never bought duplicate copies because we had this tiny budget and we were afraid that would, but now we realize that's not the right model. The right model is looking at the books that are going off the shelves and buying more and more of those books um, to make sure that they're going out and making sure that we're reaching the right people. Um, so some of it is about how informed we are about our communities and what we know they, their needs are. Um, and we know in our community that people need socialization. They need to connect. You know, I think that was mentioned yesterday. Bob brought that up in his you know that people are isolated and we knew during pan the pandemic that people are isolated the beauty of a small library in our community is we know some of those folks and who they were so one of the first things we did was implement calling patrons weekly who we knew might be alone and not have anybody else to talk to and the response to that was not only fantastic from the people we called because they were like you're just calling me to check on me 
but from our leaders. They were like, wow, you took the time to do that. Um, we worked from home pretty well. Librarians can do that. There were other departments that weren't able to do that very well, but we were. Um, and a couple of our staff who weren't able to work as well from home um, and were still getting paid. Every, our city made sure that every employee from our part-timers to our full-timers was paid when they were at home, whether they could work or not. Um, but those, those people were willing to make those calls, even though they didn't, knew they didn't have to. Just to keep you there for a little longer, so tell me a bit more about that calling. When you said there were people calling in, what, what, what was that? What you... Our staff called, mm -hmm. our, we, we identified patrons and we asked other people in the community, do you know somebody who doesn't have anybody with them, that they're alone during this pandemic, that they're staying in an apartment by themselves, um, or what, and we made those phone calls. Um, we can't afford to buy, we don't have a public transportation system, and we can't afford to buy um, vending machines to put books into, so we bought lockers. We put them outside, and we were hopping. Um, we were working in two teams. When our doors were shut, we weren't really closed. Um, we were still doing this work, um, making sure that our community felt connected to us in whatever way we could. And I think libraries are about connection. That is, to me, probably the biggest thing we do. Bridging and bonding, like was um, Felton, I think, mentioned yesterday. We're about connecting people to each other. We're about connecting people to us. And we're about connecting people to what their resources and what they need. So Pat, I don't want to um, put you on the spot here, but you know, this kind of the term floating in the air was our brand is books. Everything Jenny has said there says the brand is, is not books, it's something else. Do you, can you pick up on that? What is that? Where does that fit? Yeah, a couple of thoughts on this. Um, first of all, I think of what Carmen, where's Carmen this morning? Yeah, what Carmen did at Highwood, you know, it's a high, Highwood uh, and Community Center. I think that makes so much sense. And we've said during the pandemic that Yes, we're a library in our traditional business. For a period of time here, we're in the business of community recovery. So I'm not too worried about the COVID kit that we passed out making a connection to reading right now. We just had to do everything we could to kind of help the community recover. But I do have the perspective of small libraries and urban libraries. In fact, Bob Putman's book, uh, Our Kids, where he talks about the decline of his hometown, Port Clinton. I was a library director in Port Clinton. Um, first one, four years, we had um, 13 folks who worked at that library. So the small communities have to be all of that because oftentimes they are the only cultural institution to put all of those things together. So we can handle that, I think, on the micro level that makes a lot of sense. But the macro level about our shared elevator speech about what our profession is all about has to be different. And um, I would say the shift that we have to make is we've focused too much on the noun books. We have to focus on the verb reading. And in that regard, we can make a library a verb instead of a noun as well. Because, uh, and, I, and I'll tell you, what, you, know, you have to say, well, why, why is that? And I, I'm going to relate this back to, to, um, to Tim as well, because, um, Tim, we're in danger of running out of readers. So we do a lot of work in Columbus around mapping third grade reading proficiency. Why do we focus on third grade reading proficiency? Because Dr. James Heckman, some of you have read his work from the University of Chicago, if you're not reading at the third grade level by third grade, you're four times more likely to drop out of high school. Just let that sink in for a little bit. And there's almost a one-to-one -one correlation of the skills you have for kindergarten readiness to third grade reading proficiency. So it's not about starting at the beginning of third grade. It is those critical first eight years of life that are so important. So we serve 10 school districts. The largest is the Columbus City Schools, about 55,000 students. And pre-pandemic, their third grade reading proficiency scores were 43%. 57% not reading at the third grade level by third grade. What do you think it is in the first year of the pandemic? It's 23%. So we have more than three out of four third graders, and they hold back 1%. So 
So they're, you know, we're going to fourth grade. And I get it. How do you hold back 5,000 kids, right? It's impossible to do. We have not only the opportunity, I think we have the moral obligation to help kids learn to read and try to own the out-of-school time of libraries with, not by ourselves, but a lead role in that space. And sadly, there's a lifetime of opportunity for us that we can let the circulation part go, make that self-service for those who still need content, but our focus has to be on building relationships with kids in order to have them develop an essential life skill of reading. So, so yes, of course. So one of the things that I've loved in the last couple of days, and I'm gonna call out our friend Rich over there for DC Public, because you know, I've been uh, on CBS, I've seen the commercial run a few times about the kids and reading, that's, that's I love that. Uh, so Pat's right on, and he, um, you know, I uh, totally agree, you know, and Pat, and, and I've talked about that for years, and just preparing, um, and so we just implemented actually some of the launch pads to help, you know, to help kids, because, you know, as, uh, as Crosby mentioned about the uh, iPhone, right, and the technology, so how do you mix the technology in with reading, gamification, also you don't need the internet, don't need broadband access, and, and focusing on pre-K to third grade. So that's some of the, some opportunities for us as well. So totally agree with you, Pat. Okay, well just following on from that, then there's actually a question from the floor, Jenny. So crudely, should libraries teach children to read? Yes and no. Yes and no. Um, I think libraries need to work with the people who are teaching our kids to read, their parents and their teachers, their educators, um, and then we need to work with each other to make sure that we're doing the early literacy work in the libraries. And when I say work with each other, I'm talking about what, what Kelvin and Pat are talking about, the messaging that needs to come across the nation. Um, we were t I was talking earlier with John um, about this from every library. Um, we need to find a way to have a national initiative that includes all libraries of all sizes and all communities because we can't put ads on buses in North Liberty. I don't have a transportation system and I don't have the funds to do that, unfortunately. Um, our transportation system is, I had a homeless guy come in a few weeks ago and I called somebody at City Hall and said, can you help me figure this out? And she said, yep, we'll get a, a voucher for him to get a taxi. And we got him a taxi to a, to a homeless shelter to get started with the services that he needed. We couldn't do that, but what I did was run in the back and get the snacks that we give out every day to the kids and make him a bag with snacks and water in it. Um, so those are the things we can do. And he's, he might or might not remember that, but I, I sent him off with what I could provide. And that's that micro level stuff that we're talking about. We do micro work in our libraries every day, but we don't think enough on the macro and the meso levels that social workers learn in school, which is why we need social workers in our libraries and why we need to partner with so many other organizations to do what we're doing. Um, but on the other end, I, uh, North Liberty is the first library in Iowa to become a family place library. So we were able to raise the funds to go to New York City or New York, Long Island to get the training um, from Center Reach to be a family place library. And we'll start that, we got that in 2019. So that's been on hold for a while, um, but we will launch that in the fall, we hope, where we every, for five weeks, families will come in and parents will be on the floor playing with their kids. They won't have their phones in their hands. They will have books and wooden toys and all the things that kids need to develop, which literacy is about reading, yes, and it's about play for kids. It's about all the things that we're gonna teach them. So we need to be the place where they, they know they can go to learn. Um, and we talked about this a little last night. I mentioned this during a conversation last night we need to teach kids to learn. And we need to teach the importance of reading to parents and children. So reading as a, as a component of learning rather. But you know, it does feel like you know, the, our brand is reading rather than our brand is, uh, is books. So I don't understand literacy. You know, there, there must be different interpretations of that term. But you know, Kelvin, following on from that then, so we started with e-books and I'm saying they dislocate the patron from the library. And Jenny has spoken very clearly many times about how important the, the building is, the library, the environment. 
Kelvin, any thoughts on how you could use ebooks to connect people to the library? Yeah, so to, to Jenny's point, um, you know, I'm, a, I'm larger so I can do the buses, but I'll tell you, you know, uh, leveraging barbershops, for example, uh, leveraging laundromats, like when I was in Queens. So there's ways. Coasters and bars. Co yeah, well, post, yeah, we did that in, coasters, in Broward, yeah. actually. We had coasters mm -hmm. that we put in bars, actually. So, so looking at those opportunities, but, you know, literacy through engagement. Right, always learning and taking taking the opportunity to uh, you know to do that. So, you know, I, I'm going to take a you know another another swing and you know at, at that and say we talked a little, you know Tony and I were, were chatting and, and I was talking about you know marketing. So my background is in marketing as well, and so that's why I use the outside ways to market the library to bring people inside the library. Instead of you know putting all the, the emphasis on the people who are already coming in the door, how can I expand that out, or how can I work with different partners to do that? For example, um, oh, um, you know, seniors who have been uh, because of COVID, you know, we we all, but you know, essentially seniors in, in Vegas have a higher uh, suicide rate. I didn't know that when I you know when I moved to to Vegas, but apparently they do. So we um, we've started a reading program with a um, with an organization called three square and so we've moved we've brought meal we're bringing meals and reading together inside the library mm -hmm. for example so those are some that's another I, I, idea to help bring you know people in and uh, you know focusing on working with um, prison um, uh, systems right the prison systems or organizations that help support you know, um, you know, um, recidivism, for example, those are ideas that, that we're working on as, you know, as well. You know, we talk about reading and literacy and learning, and one of the things that I know uh, and I focus on is really dismantling what I call the pipelines to prison and introducing pipelines to literacy, education, and success for our communities. So thank you, Pat. Just kind of switching tack a little bit. You mentioned data earlier, and uh, you know, so again, a question from the floor: What are the best ways to capture ebook data use, and how might you do you know, drill deeper while still uh, being mindful of privacy and uh, you know respect, to, you know, and other issues like that? Um, can you, one more yeah. time, Tony. Just how, how could we capture ebook data use? What can we? What could we know? What might we? want to do with with the data yeah so i started at a pretty basic level of just saying well how many customers do you have that actually have streamed um, or downloaded an ebook um, you just got to go deeper um, first of all this is aggregate data i'm not looking at what kelvin is actually doing i'm looking at the people in kelvin's neighborhood and what they might be um, looking at but um, you know, it's to say, well, how many have downloaded one book only, ever? How many do one a month? How many are in both spaces? And what's the ratio that we're seeing? You know, the, the, the question I asked you, Tony, about is 150,000 a good number? I mean, it's positive. I'm not saying it's a bad number because it represents growth and greater integration. But I think we often capture what happened rather than setting goals out to actually say we're trying to achieve that. And I think we've been guilty of not connecting our silos, not connecting our public service people to understand what we're trying to do in that space, not having our centralized collection management people understand what they might be asking the people in the locations to do or remotely. And then how are we connecting through marketing and social media and do we have enough meetings where those three come together to say, we're trying to have 100,000 ebook users by the end of the year. What's that going to take? Instead, I think oftentimes we just capture it and say, well, this is what happened. So, um, but I, I just think it's, it's being creative. It's being curious, asking that. You said you're not good at answering questions, but you're good at asking. I think that's, that's part of it because a well-defined problem is half solved. So Kevin, what, I mean, similar question, you know, data and questions you'd like answered. So all what Pat said, but what I would also add to that is around the programmatic aspects as well. So I would want to know, for example, 
the that information that you talked about regarding who's using our you know the ebooks, but I, I bring in the physical books as well, and then also how that ties in with programs because that's a essential uh, this essential work that we're doing also, right? And so you know, but I start really at the basics and really first try to find out how many library cards do we have out there? Who's using the library card? Who used the, uh, you know, we, Pat asked us a question earlier, like how many people um, know how many library card holders they have? But do you also know how many people used, how many of those library card holders actually used the library card in the last six months, in the last year? It, you know, and so when you dig deep into that, you know, what I've found that now three large library systems is it's a third of a third of a third, <laughs> right? So there's like 900, there was like 900,000 card holders at Queens. We had about 300,000 people that actually used it, but in a year there was like a third of that that actually had even checked out any material. So, and that day, and I repeated that same analysis, for example, in Broward, and then I've done it in Las Vegas as well. So data is definitely key to, uh, to how we you know, can do our jobs even better. But then again, digging deeper in that data and using heat maps, for example, and you know, all, of, all of those you know, to answer and ask questions. Uh, Tony, one, one more piece to add on to that. I, I don't know what you have all experienced, but um, again, this great disruptor of the pandemic, library use is a habit, and the habit has been disrupted in the biggest way. And I, you know, what, what's really troubling for us is the usage, usage is coming back much faster in our affluent neighborhoods, but in the locations that need the service the greatest, we're having the biggest struggle. You know, to the point of kids not coming back to the library and say, what has happened to that? And what are our new strategies for how we're going to connect? And do we, do we have time after this to, or is this it? Are we done after this? Oh, we're on, we're we're on right Amber, now. so. Uh, <laughs> what, what's that? <laughs> we're on Amber. Amber, alert. But we're, we're coming, coming back. back. We're coming back. Yeah, yeah all right. I'll back. talk, I'll we're talk about back. sort of programmatically some ideas later. <laughs> Okay, actually, and, and uh, yeah, we've got just a few minutes left. So, Jenny, I maybe give you a couple of minutes to just to think. You know, is there one big thing you want to land here? Is there one thought that has emerged from what you've heard today and yesterday? I mean, it's it's the same thought, but I think, I mean, hoping that this this convening comes as a place where we start to ask the questions that we need to ask, um, and those questions are how do we leverage what's happening in libraries now or the decline in circulation um, with, but like in our library, as, as Kelvin's mentioned, programs are increasing. Um, and we aren't getting the numbers back of the kids and, and that's something that's a whole nother thing. We're all crying over missing our kids um, in our library, but but where do we where do we go now? What's the brand and what's the model that we need to create? Um, I'm gonna just tell you a real quick thing about our library. Um, our library is located in a community center that is 60,000 square feet, which includes a recreation center, two swimming pools, a communications department, a before and after school program, and our library. Um, and it works. That model works. It's, it's not only a place for civic engagement. I have couples who come in in the morning and one sits down to read the paper while his wife goes upstairs and walks the track. Um, you know, we do things like, on, we started with a Monday morning um, we used to call it senior coffee hour, now we just call it social hour because it is not just seniors anymore, it's people who want to make connections. Um, and the group has grown. In fact, last week we had 24 people sitting in our magazine area and they talk about politics and they're really loud and they disagree and agree. And then one of the guys started bringing slides in and showing traveling that he'd done. So he was doing armchair traveling presentations. We didn't have anything to do with it. We just provided the space. So how do we, as libraries, be that place, a place of civic commons, the place where people can connect and meet and bridge those gaps and bridge economic differences and social differences and equity differences? How do we become that? And the question is answered in marketing. It's partly marketing. It's partly how we train the people coming up. I'm talking to Nicole yesterday. I said, I'll, I'll volunteer to talk to your class anytime. It's how we bring new librarians in and what, what that looks like. And it's how we make connections with those average librarians 
And I'll say right here, I'm not an average librarian. I'm a leader. And we know that libraries aren't good at that. We're not good at speaking up about those things. But I am a leader in my community. People recognize me. And when I used to say, I need to be at this table, can I come to this meeting? And people would say, who are you and where are you from? Now they call me and say, hey, could you come to this meeting? We need your input. And that's where we need to be. So, Kelvin, maybe just a few last words. Leadership. So what does leading look like? Leading is actionable. Leading is organizing, collaboration, strategic vision, vision, and really execution. That's what leadership is to me. Like putting, so uh, you know, our strategic plan that we implemented in Las Vegas is all around action. We actually call it Strategic Playbook 2026. So it's based on getting things done, and it's wrapped around the community, people, places, partners, and platforms. So that's the, the approach that, that, I, that I've taken. And leadership is, um, I'm the leader, but certainly I look to all the leaders within the organization, at the top, the bottom, across the organization, and they all have a role in that strategic execution of that plan. Thank you. Pat, maybe you want to just bring this home? Uh, where do I want to bring it home? Well, to? just the fi final thoughts on fi final I'm thoughts. I'm just learning that there's an amber button. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> You're that kind of leader. Yeah, I mean, you know, so leadership, collaboration. What we, what have we learned here? You know, what, what is, the, what does that look like? You know, it's we, a, it's a great inter interview question. What's more important, management or leadership? And the answer is, uh, what's more important, inhaling or exhaling? Right. These are two things that absolutely go together. But you know, we manage things. And we lead people by creating a compelling vision and the passion around a problem to solve that marshals all of our resources. And uh, it's what this group does all across the country in a profession that I think, um, with, not without our challenges, um, but I, I think we've got a great future. But I, I'll leave with, uh, with a quote that some of us heard, uh, some of us here attend the, the Knight Foundation meetings. And they have the, uh, from the Knight Ritter newspapers now, the, the Knight Foundation. And we're not a Knight Ritter community, but when they call you in Columbus in January and ask if you want to come to Miami for a couple of days, you know, it's, I'm 100% uh, every year. Um, but I remember the, the CEO of the Knight Foundation saying to all of the assembled librarians, don't make the mistake that newspapers did. We assumed permanence. I think that is right in front of our eyes what's happening. And, you know, I'm, I still have, um, if my career is a runway, I have more of the runway behind the plane than in front of the plane. Yet, on the other hand, I think there's a lot of folks saying, man, I got three years to that retirement. I'm just going to keep my head down. I can make it. We've got to confront the blunt truth on this and really change what this is all about and, um, and, and accept that challenge and, and assume the responsibility for it and have the courage to do so.